Welcome back, folks, to the Lessons from the Cockpit show. I'm your host, Mark Hacera, former KC-135 pilot and the author of the book Tanker Pilot Lessons from the Cockpit, which is available on Amazon in all four formats, and today is the sponsor for our show. Ask any pilot to define flying and they will tell you long periods of boredom interrupted by short intermittent periods of extreme terror. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we investigate the tactics, techniques, and procedures aviators created and cultivated during those extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and private flying operations. This exploration gives listeners practical advice on how the aviation world works and expands critical thinking skills and expertise in the air and on the ground. Many of these stories have never been told before, and today we're going to go through some of those on this, the anniversary of Desert Storm 31 years ago today. So, grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show. 31 years ago today, I flew my very first combat mission. The opening night of Desert Storm, I was leading a three-ship of KC-135s loaded to the gills with gas, flying at 21,000 feet, refueling F-4G Advanced Wild Weasels, the airplane that is designed to find the surface air missile sites and destroy them with a missile that moves at Mach 3 with about 900 tungsten quarter-inch steel cubes in its warhead. And this is a mission that we had been assigned by our leadership to do. I'm a young captain. I've got two majors behind me in Tuna 6-5 and Tuna 6-6. I'm in Tuna 6-4. And we've got a really important mission because the airplanes we are refueling are a air campaign no-go item. Tonight we're going into uh, Iraq and we're going to make sure Saddam leaves Kuwait which uh, he invaded on the very day Valerie and I got to Okinawa, August 2nd, 1990. I had known for a couple weeks that this was going to happen, but couldn't share it with anybody. We came back from a mission in December, late December, and Lieutenant Colonel Dave Wright, D. Wright, met me in the hall and says, hey, Sluggo, come with me. I got something to show you. We went into our top secret room where we had a safe. And he dialed the number up and took out a folder that had an orange cover sheet on it saying top secret across the top. And it had a single piece of paper in it and he handed it to me and just says one word to me, read. And it has a big smile on his face. Holding the thing out in front of me, it says from US CENTAF slash CC to all units, subject, Operation Desert Storm. The main body of the message says, Implement Wolfpack, D-Day, 17 January, 1991. H-Hour, 0300 Baghdad time, midnight Zulu. Good luck and good hunting, Horner. I was holding in my hands the message from the commander of all air forces in the region saying, we're going to start Desert Storm on the 17th of January. The first bombs will drop at 3 a.m. Baghdad time. I was holding a very historic message. And I really appreciate D. Wright sharing that with me. So I had knowledge of when this was all going to happen. I knew when we got a phone call on the evening of the 16th to come in at 1030 what was about to happen. But I couldn't tell my crew. I wasn't allowed to tell them. But they found out soon enough. Once I got that phone call saying your report time is, I think it was 10 o'clock. I gathered up my crew, Kenny, Kevin, Rick, and told them our report time is 10 o'clock. Tonight we're making the donuts. Tonight the war starts. I remember talking to them individually just for a few moments. But for the rest of the evening, I'll admit to you, I was scared. I had doubts about my abilities. I wondered, you know, am I going to screw up? All these thoughts are going through your mind. It's like going through the Super Bowl and you have to think mentally, you are prepared for this. And I didn't change my thinking. I should have said, I am prepared for this. I am ready to go. Because we were. We had been in the theater for several months 
But still, in the back of your mind, you have doubts about going into the big game. But I'll be honest with you. Strategic Air Command did not prepare KC-135 crews for this kind of mission. Our whole focus had been the nuclear mission. Everything was done for us, checklist items, everything. But none of us had flown a conventional war using visual flight rules to basically execute our missions. We were told in Strategic Air Command, you will fly instrument flight rules to the maximum extent possible. And we did everything on instrument flight rules, IFR. And now we're flying VFR in the middle of the night with hundreds of airplanes around us. And so our training really didn't prepare us for this kind of evening. Not too long ago, I read an article about an LA cop. She had been out on a call. When she got out on that call, she ran into the bad guys. One of the bad guys shot her three times in the chest. And even though she had her body armor on, was seriously injured. She was able to shoot her assailants, even though she was seriously wounded. But when they got to the hospital, she took 109 pints of blood and they had to revive her twice on the operating table. And she said after this experience, prepare your mind for where your body is going to take you. And of course, combat is one of those things where you really have to prepare your mind for where your body is going to go. And I'm in an airplane at 21,000 feet. I'm not like the guys on the ground that are like going door to door in their tanks and the infantrymen and so forth. And I've got a lot of protection around me. But we had to prepare our minds for where our bodies were going to take us so that these F4G wild weasels, call sign Coors, Lone Star, and Michelob, they're all named after beer, and the EF-111 jamming airplanes, all named after a household tool, Drill, were going to go. The night before this mission had been declared a maintenance stand down on our base so that all the maintainers could kind of catch their breath, get all the airplanes prepared. And fortunately, the airplane I was flying was 8019. Vonnie Peterson was the crew chief and she was fantastic. She was one of the best crew chiefs I ever had for an airplane. But we had to prepare in other ways. For two nights, we had flown what were called mirror strikes, where basically we practiced this mission with Coors, Lone Star, and Michelob and Drill on our wings on an air refueling track that was in the middle of Saudi Arabia over the top of the An Nafud Desert. This incredible deserted place in the center of Saudi Arabia. Prior to flying the first mirrored strike, we got a phone call and a message to call this number and contact this person. My navigator and I went to a secure phone, called that number and asked for that name. The name was Lieutenant Colonel George Walton, call sign John Boy. And he was the mission commander for this particular flight of F-4Gs and EF-111s. He told us how much he appreciated the tankers. He says, you guys have always been right where we needed you with plenty of gas. And I don't expect that to change for this mission. But guys, we have a really important mission because we're a no-go item. If we don't get our gas, get to our targets, Nobody goes in there except for F-117 stealth fighters and, of course, the cruise missiles. Air refueling is all about requirements. And John's boy's requirements were these. About halfway up our air refueling track, Saddam's early warning ground control intercept radars would see us. And that line where the radars of Saddam could see us, we called the high early warning ground control intercept line. It was kind of a semicircle line of the extreme end of how far their radars could see. John Boy told us we had to go through that electronic screening line at a certain time. I can accept 10 seconds early 
or 20 seconds late. We had a 30 second window to go through that line. And that's where they would begin gathering intelligence information on who was looking at them and how. The next thing he told us was, we have to be dropped off at the end refueling point full of gas at this time. And again, we cannot accept 10 seconds early or 30 seconds late. Do you understand? And this is where our training really failed us. You see, Strategic Air Command, you see, this is where Strategic Air Command's training really failed us in the tanker community. The nuclear missions were based on indicated airspeed. The fighters did all of their mission planning based on ground speed. And sometimes there was a fairly decent disparity between those two measurements of airspeed, which could throw all of our timing off. And so it was really important that we got from John Boy, what ground speed do we need to be flying so that we can make your timing? That was a critical question that we had to ask. Normally we fueled the F4G wild weasels at 315 knots indicated airspeed. In order to meet John Boy's ground speed requirement, we had to fly three knots faster at 318 knots to maintain the timing, which we were able to do. My navigator, Kevin, was fantastic. One of the best navigators in our squadron at the 909th at Kadena. So the first mirror strike that we did going down what was called the Lime Pre-Strike Refueling Track Went pretty good. Everyone was able to get their gas. They didn't take their full amount of gas. And we were able to meet our timing within pretty close tolerances of what John Boy had requested. So we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. We got on the ground and we debriefed with him over the phone. And said, yeah, everything went pretty well. Uh, can we adjust this? Can you do this for us? And, and it was just really small things. So when we flew the mirror strike the second night, we were spot on. Everything went according to plan. And it was great. It's a great feeling when a plan comes off that way, when you've got such tight requirements from your customers. But as with all things combat, no plan will survive its first contact in combat. And of course, this night, it didn't. The mirror strikes had gone really well, but we didn't have any threats. And tonight, the 17th, we had a lot of things happening. Reaching our join up point, John Boy and all 12 of his F4G advanced wild weasels and the three EF 111s met just like where they were supposed to which really was an incredible feat because the EF-111s were coming from Taif on the Red Sea and John Boy's Wild Weasels were coming from Bahrain on the other side of Saudi Arabia. And we were on the other side of Saudi Arabia along the Red Sea also. And so all of this choreography was coming together at a point, time, altitude, and it was perfect. We all joined up. Got everybody through. You have to test all of the air refueling systems and they all tested good. They all tested good. We were really happy. So now we're just orbiting to wait for the time where we have to push north. My navigator, Kevin, said over the intercom, pilot, time to turn north. And I look back and he's got his right hand up in a, and it's going into the vertical, meaning time to turn. John Boy said over the radio, turn at the same time, I went into the turn. So we're all on the same sheet of music. And it's great when it's like this. Pushing north, we got through that high early warning ground controlled intercept line five seconds early, which is a testament to Kevin's capabilities. He was really good. As soon as we got through that line, all hell broke loose on the radios. Task Force Normandy, a group of helicopters assigned to destroy one of those early warning radar sites, 
had just launched its missiles, shooting its guns at that site. Someone, an Iraqi in that early warning site, got off a phone call to Baghdad, said, here they come. The Americans, the coalition is coming. So all of Baghdad's defenses are now alerted. All the radars are looking south and they're getting ready for us. And I hear from the airborne warning and control airplane, the E-3 AWACS, as it's called. Bandits airborne, bandits airborne. Ike and Manny. Ike and Manny are what we call bullseye points. They're reference points on the ground. Manny was in the west. Ike was next to Baghdad. It was actually an island in Tharthar Lake west of Baghdad. And so what you do is you have a 360 degree radials on them, just like a compass. And you call out Ike 18055, which means the bad guys are south 55 miles of that island. And that's kind of how we keep track of where the threats are. And that's exactly what Choctaw was calling out. But adding one thing, they were climbing and they were moving fast. And then the next call told us that the very airfield we were the most concerned about, Medicis Airfield, very far south of Baghdad, had also gone active. Choctaw calls out multiple groups of fulcrums and F-1s. Ike, 175 at 95, south fast, which means they're coming at us. And Kevin plotted it and said, they're only 100, 120 miles in front of us. It was really pucker time. Here comes the threats. We had gone over how we were going to handle threat calls. And we actually had a trip wire where we said, if the enemy air-to-air -air fighters are 80 miles from us, then we have to turn around. We have to retrograde. But they weren't inside that 80 miles, so we kept moving north. But our pucker factor went up. Our nervous level went way up. And now we're having to deal with airborne threats. There was another call by AWACS. And then right after that, we heard this radio call, one of the greatest radio calls I've ever heard in my career. Penzoa check, two, three, four. Exxon check, two, three, four. Mobile check, two, three, four. Xerox check, two, three, four. It was all the air-to-air F-15s checking on. And Rick Tolini, the mission commander, said... Push purple one, which was their discrete frequency to go up there and start shooting down MiGs. But they were pushing off early. Everything was off our planned timing. And he pushed, I think it was five to seven minutes early, which is an eternity in air combat. So things are kind of looking like they're not going our way. And it gets worse when we get to the end AR point, the end air refueling point, right when we're supposed to. And one of John Boy's wild weasels, Coors 3-4, cannot get gas in his tanks. I don't know why, if it was a pressurization problem or what, but he keeps getting what we call a pressure disconnect, meaning his system thinks it's full, but keeps blowing off the boom, but he doesn't have the gas he needs. And so after several attempts, he finally gets on, but we had to make a decision. What are we going to do here? We're at our end point and we're going toward all of those threats and the Saudi border. Well, of course, our job was to make sure John Boy got his gas. We continued going north. Our minds were prepared for where our bodies were going to take us. Finally, Rick Brack, my boom operator, says, we just got a pressure disconnect. He's got his gas. He's moving. He's moving to the left. He's moving to the left. And I looked out my window just in time to see John Boy wave at me and drop down. And he disappeared under our nose because he's pushing forward. And the EF-111, Drill 7-1, that's assigned to them, is also pushing forward. About two miles in front of us, he reappears under our nose. And I'm looking out and I see this 11,000 foot cotton blanket of overcast clouds that the weather guys told us was right on the border of Saudi Arabia and Iraq. They said it literally starts right there. And here's this white cotton blanket out in front of us. And I see the four weasels move out 
And the EF-111 is moving from right to left behind them. And then I see their lights go out. They're at their fence checkpoint. Final checkpoint where they look around and check their fuel, their electronics, their navigation systems, their countermeasures. Uh, they go master arm on so that uh, their missiles and weapons control systems are all turned on. We dropped them off just a scant few miles from where they were preparing to go into combat. Well, we're done. So I'm saying, hey, guys, I'm pushing it up. This is going to be on CNN. And we turn left and start heading back toward Jeddah. Now, as we're flying back towards Jeddah, we go about three quarters of the way south on the track, just to the west of it. Because there's other air refueling tankers that are coming up from the south. More airplanes needing gas going into Iraq. Kenny says, oh my gosh, look at them all. And we both look outside and there's hundreds of red rotating beacons signifying airplanes because every one of them has these anti-collision beacons on them and they're all flashing red. And it was just mind blowing. I and mean, we didn't say anything over the intercom. We just, we were mesmerized by this huge wave of red rotating beacons going by us. We land in the middle of the night. Taif Air Base has fog and the fighters can't land. And a bunch of the F-111s have to land at Jeddah. We finally get back to our apartment. And again, I'm a news junkie and I want to see this. And I go and I turn it on. And of all things, there is John Boy Walton being interviewed by CNN. And he's talking about the mission. And a chill went up my spine. My crew is like hooting and hollering. That's who we refueled. That's who we refueled. That's the guy. And he had just gotten out of the airplane because his hair is all messed up. And he still has the imprint of the tight oxygen mask on his face. You could see it across the bridge of his nose and over his cheeks and everything. That oxygen mask had left that imprint in his face. So he hadn't been out of the airplane very long. And he's talking about... Baghdad being lit up like a Christmas tree and he's getting ready to go out on another flight after he gets something to eat. And, and he's talking about the beauty of the system that, you know, we were all bringing everybody back because the beauty of the system is we're outside of their threat ring. They're not going to get us. And, and it was just really cool to see John Boy <laughs> on TV. And then a really strange thing happened. Rick said, hey, Mark, the phone's for you. And I thought, Oh, you know, they're calling us about our next mission. I answered like I normally do. And there was laughter on the end of the phone. It was my dad. Somehow my dad had gotten the phone number to our apartment in Saudi Arabia. He goes, hey, son, how you doing? You know, and I said, well, dad, uh, I'm sure you've seen the news. <laughs> We've been really busy tonight. I can't tell you much. And we just talked about several things. Of course, I couldn't tell him what I'd done that night or anything. But it was just great to hear my dad's voice on the end of the phone. Found out later he'd gotten the phone number from my wife. And my wife had called me a couple times also at our apartment. It's always good to hear your wife's voice over the phone. Because obviously her father and my brothers-in-law were all up watching what was going on over Baghdad, wondering what I was doing. So that was my first combat mission. Over a period of time, you become pretty comfortable flying combat missions. Scientifically, they've been able to prove that it's usually after mission number 10. And that's the whole reason why we have the U.S. Air Force's Red Flag Program. Designed by Colonel Moody Sutter a number of years ago, decades ago, because from the Vietnam War, we learned most people got shot down in their first 10 missions. And if you could get those first 10 missions under your belt, then the chances are you're going to survive. They created this incredible training program over the ranges of Nellis Air Force Base, north of Las Vegas, with simulated threats, air-to-air -air threats, ground threats, the whole works, to help give people their basically 10 mission mark. On this particular night, we're on about mission five or six. And the reason I remember this mission is because of what I saw. We were on Olive Pre-Strike Track, Olive Pre, which was just west 
of lime pre, which we had done the first night. Again, we're over the middle of the Anna food desert. And, and even at night, you can see this desert below you and the sand dunes and everything, even on these dark nights. It was really clear in Saudi Arabia. We're refueling F-15Es on my airplane. We're leading a five ship of tankers, I believe this time. And we're refueling Stingray flight. All the F-15Es are named after cars. And this is how we knew what was coming up to get gas from us by listening to the call sign. If we heard beer, we knew it was wild weasels. If we heard uh, oil products, we knew it was F-15C models, uh, air to air. And if it was um, EF-111s, it was household tools, ratchet, drill. So we got Stingray flight. And these four F-15Es were gonna get about 15,000 pounds a piece. 60 to 70,000 pounds was how much we were gonna give them. Now, we're flying the old A model tankers, which have the old engines, and we are not very fuel efficient like the new engine tankers are. And so we were flying this mission pretty much with about an 80,000 pound offload, and that was all we could give. And I remember Stingray Flight joining us outside our wings on this really dark night. And they had their formation strip lights on. They call them slime lights because it's kind of a slimy yellow-green color when these things are on. They're at different places along the fuselage, on the nose, on the tips of the wings, on the empennage in the back, on the tails. That kind of gives you a reference how to fly formation. But the really odd thing about this night was Stingray was flying in this dark airplane, this extremely dark airplane, gunship gray and black is how this thing is painted, with white bombs. They're called Mark 20 Rockeye bombs, and they are cluster bombs. Having this dark airplane, these slimy yellow lights and these bright white bombs join outside my airplane just intrigued me. And I was wondering why. I later found out the Strike Eagle was such a new airplane that they haven't done all of the weapon separation tests for it yet. And it could only legally carry certain types of bombs. So at that time, they were doing the separation tests to, to make sure that when they dropped the bombs, the bombs didn't come back and hit the airplane or do something silly like spinning around in the jet wash of the airplane which is why they do those tests, they could only carry certain types of weapons. The first night, they were carrying like 12 500-pound bombs. Tonight, this group was carrying white cluster bombs. And that image has never left my mind. I can pull that up in a moment's notice. See, there's a lot of preparation that goes into getting an airplane operational. And these weapon separation tests are one of them. These airplanes were extremely capable airplanes. They were targeted against uh, SCUD sites, SCUD ballistic missile sites. That's why they were carrying these cluster bombs. They would drop these things on uh, the SCUD sites. And it was just unusual to see these dark airplanes, kind of luminescent green-yellow lights and these bright white bombs on Stingray flight. Now, we got to the end there at refueling point, dropped them off, loaded to the gills with gas, more flights behind us, the F-15s, the jamming airplanes. And again, all of these airplanes were coming from different bases. This is such an incredible choreography to get all this moving at the right uh, tempo and so forth. But all we needed was a point, a time, and an altitude for air refueling. That's really all we need. And we can go and set up, start refueling folks. But it was just incredible to see all of these airplanes coming from all these different places. The EF-111s coming from Taif, again, on the Red Sea. The F-15Cs were coming from Dahran in the Northern Arabian Gulf. The Strike Eagles were coming from, we call it Al's Garage, al Karj, Al's Garage, in central Saudi Arabia, just south of Riyadh. This later becomes Prince Sultan Air Base and plays a huge role in Operation Iraqi Freedom. All of these pieces are coming together. You have to do the separation tests. You've got to, all these airplanes have got to come together and fly these missions. And they're all supporting each other in various ways. It was just really a sight to see that night. The first couple days of Desert Storm, 
the weather was terrible. Embedded thunderstorms, raining. I mean, it was just incredible weather. Because you think Saudi Arabia, the desert, so forth, it never rains. But man, these were monster thunderstorms. And when you get in this kind of environment where you have all these thunderstorms, one of the things that happens in your airplane is you get what's called St. Elmo's fire. It's static electricity, and it's always on the windshield of our airplane. And you see all these little lightning bolts moving around on the windscreen, and it's purple and it's blue, and all these little lightning bolts, uh, like you see uh, the lightning in the, in the bulb. I'm sure you've all seen it in sci-fi movies. That's exactly what it looks like, except for this purple and blue and white hue that goes around it. And believe me, it's really, really powerful. My co-pilot stuck his finger in it and it shocked him back into his seat. So all this is going on the first couple nights and finally the weather clears. And because of the weather, we hadn't been able to get pictures of the things that we'd been bombing and destroying. So now, in order to find out, are we being effective and efficient, we have to go get pictures of the targets to see if they're destroyed, to see where the bombs have hit, if the bombs have even hit. We're using precision guided weapons, but also, like I said the other night, we're using non-precision weapons in those Mark 20 Rockeye cluster bombs. On this particular day, because they need a lot of missions flown, the tankers are doing what we call double turn. We fly a mission, we come back, we debrief that mission, and then we brief another mission and go out and fly that mission. It makes for like about an 18 to 20 hour day. And we'd already been flying missions for a couple days, so we were exhausted. And now we're having a double turn and we're gonna be really tired now. In the morning, we take off and we are refueling photo reconnaissance. The airplanes that we're refueling are from Bergstrom, which was a big RF-4 photo reconnaissance Phantom base. And they're being escorted again by wild weasels. You can't go into Iraqi airspace unless you have wild weasels. Now, all of the RF-4C Phantoms that are taking pictures all have the pine call sign. We go up to, I think it was Gopher, which was northwestern Saudi Arabia. And it's an anchor track. So we're flying this left-hand oval that is 70 mile legs, uh, 35 mile across, kind of like a NASCAR track. And except it's 70 mile legs and 30 miles, 35 miles wide. We're refueling pine. They take about 10,000 pounds each. The weasels take about 12 to 13,000 pounds. And we sit out and wait. They go up, make their runs, get all the pictures that they need. They come back again about 20 minutes later, refill up on gas again, and then we leave. And you have to understand, they're taking miles of film. These are all old 1991 film cameras, but they have high resolution cameras. They've got long focal lengths so they can really, really focus in on things. Uh, it, the, the pictures that they get are incredible. And now that they're all out, the targets are all out in the open sun, they can see them, take pictures of them. The weasels are protecting them. The F-15s are protecting them. And they're getting a lot of pictures. This goes on for like two days. We come back and we get set up to fly another mission. And this time we're going back to the old reliable. We're going back to Lime Pre because this is going to be a night support mission of F-111s that are carrying bunker buster bombs and are opening up all the hardened aircraft shelters. A lot of Saddam's Air Force planes are stuffed into these big concrete bunkers. And of course, we've got these penetrating bombs, bunker buster bombs, that are opening them up and killing what's ever inside of them. We're leading, I think it was a three ship. We've got F4G wild weasels on us, four ship of F15Cs on the second tanker, and then EF111s on the back tanker. When we turn north, 
the sun has gone down, it's nighttime. And I look up in front of me and there's a five ship of tankers, all of them with four F-111s on them moving out in front of us. I fly just a little bit faster in order to close the distance between us because I'm thinking in my mind, keep this package close together. Don't keep them spread out. And if I can join on them, and again, there's 2,000 feet separation from the top guy in the five ship and me in my three ship. So we're not going to hit each other. We've got plenty of room. But I want to get close to them so the whole package goes in and they don't have to spend a lot of time getting together. And as I get closer, I can see the wild weasels. They were call sign Lone Star outside my window. But I see these 20 F-111s out in front of me. And I can see the red rotating beacons on the fighters, the red rotating beacons on top of the tankers. And I'm just in awe at what I see because those 20 F-111s are each carrying four of these Bunker Buster bombs. 80 2,000 pound laser guided GBU-24 bombs are about to go north into Baghdad. They're going to really, really mess up hardened aircraft shelters. And I just remember looking down on them. And again, we're over the on the food desert. And we've got about a sliver of a moon, maybe a quarter moon. So it's lighting everything up a little bit more. And again, it's one of these things that never go away in your mind. And folks, one of the things that I've done ever since I went on my mission for the Mormon church is keep a journal. And I kept a really accurate journal during this time period. I'd even write down the tail numbers of some of the airplanes that we refueled, how much gas we give them, really detailed notes. And that's how I'm able to put this all together. And I wrote about this in my journal, seeing the red rotating beacons, the tankers stacked up, the five of them behind each other, 500 feet up, one mile in trail, me catching up to them, the 20 F-111s on their wings, all carrying four bunker buster bombs, the wild weasels outside on my wings, the slime lights uh, glowing, the white harm missiles, and of course, the F-15s behind me, the EF-111s behind me. And there wasn't a lot of talk on the radios. I remember that night. It was fairly quiet on the radios. But again, it's one of those things that I remember from this war. One of those images I can bring up at any point in time. And that's one of the things that I remember about flying 31 years ago. I was at the top of my game. My crew was at the top of their game. We could do all of this without talking to each other. Again, give me a point, an altitude, and a time. That's all I need. And there wasn't a lot of talking going on. And Saddam wasn't flying a lot of his air force because they're getting shot down as soon as they take off. But this image in my mind, going back and looking in my journal and reading that, brings this all back to my memory from flying 31 years ago. This next mission I'm going to talk about we did just about everything you could do in a tanker on this one mission. This was really one of those intense missions that I'll never forget. And we went to an air refueling anchor area called Tangerine, but we were launched off of strip alert. In the air tasking order, they had spare aircraft designed to fill in a hole because an airplane breaks. Strip alert aircraft are waiting to be tasked with crew sitting in the airplane, listening on the radio, ready to go at a moment's notice. All the switches in the cockpit are all in the on position. All you gotta do is start engines, taxi, and take off. We had been listening to the BBC on the high frequency radio when we got a call to launch. They'd gotten intelligence that all these fighters were gonna start leaving. They didn't leave this particular night. Over the next couple days, a lot of them were fleeing toward Iran, but we'd gotten intelligence that that was gonna to happen tonight. And so they launched extra F-15s. 
most of the air refueling anchor areas in Saudi Arabia, air refueling areas, were named after fruit. Strawberry, lime, olive, lemon. Uh, there was one called Railroad, which was a holdover from the Elf One, where the AWACS was refueled during the Iran-Iraq War. Most of the places we went were named after fruit. So we got this message Tuna Boom Strip, launch and go to Tangerine, meet your F-15s there, is basically what we were told. And it took us about an hour and 10 minutes to get to Tangerine. Tangerine was literally situated right on the Iraqi-Saudi border. You could look into Iraq from Tangerine, and we were at 28,000 feet, so we could see quite a ways, but again, this was at night. As soon as we told AWACS we were established inside Tangerine, F-15s started coming on us. The F-15s were from Eglin Air Force Base, the 58th Guerrillas, and from Bitburg, operating out of Al Karsh. So all these F-15s are cycling off of us. Now, the reason this air refueling anchor area was so close to the border is so that the F-15s wouldn't have that far to fly to get gas in case they were starting to chase down MiGs because the first thing they would get rid of is a fuel tank. They drop a, the centerline fuel tank, which was 4,000 pounds of gas, meaning they were getting rid of some of their gas, which is why they needed us. So we're up there orbiting in Tangerine, watching all of this go on. And from our perch point, our vantage point at 28,000 feet, we could see things firing up into the air and we could see bombs going off on the ground to the north of us. Every time we came parallel to the border and we were just a couple of miles south of the border, we could see explosions on the ground and things firing up at the ground from the ground. And it was just amazing to watch. And then all of a sudden I heard my co-pilot go, oh my gosh, look at that. And we saw this flame on the ground and it started moving slowly upward, gaining speed. We'd seen a Scud missile launch. And I told Kevin, I said, call it in, call it in. Tell them there's a Scud missile launch just to the north of us. Apparently what had happened is there were other Scud missiles being launched also from these mobile Scud missile launchers going toward Tel Aviv and going toward Riyadh. What happened that night was some of these Scuds coming toward Riyadh were getting intercepted by the Patriot batteries near Riyadh and just outside the perimeter of King Abdul Aziz International Airport. The Patriot missile intercepted the Scud missile late, right over the top of the runways at King Khalid International Airport. And Scud parts rained down on top of the runways that the tankers were using, which basically closed the base. So now the tankers that were flying out of King Abdul Aziz, I think their call sign was Bass, are now having to divert to other bases because they can't land. And they don't know how long it's gonna to take to sweep the runway off. My good buddy, Stu Pugh, told me about this night. And he says, the Patriot leaves the box going supersonic. So you hear this big boom, boom as the Patriot leaves the battery. And they normally fire two to make sure they get the intercept. They see this big explosion over the top of the base and then parts are raining down. So now you've got to worry about, now you have to worry about were any of the airplanes hit by the debris and what debris is on the runway? Because you can't take off it'll puncture a tire. They have to go out and inspect all the airplanes and the runway before they can be cleared for operations. And this really put a wrinkle in tanker operations, having King Abdul Aziz closed for a couple hours. And now their airplanes are spreading out all over everywhere. And we just happened to go to their command post frequency because that's where we had been based before. It was called Firehouse. We put Firehouse's frequency in and you could hear all of the commotion of all these airplanes diverting all over. We stayed in Tangerine for probably another hour, just mesmerized by watching all of this stuff. If I remember right, 
the legs of Tangerine paralleled the border and kind of a northwest, southeast kind of legs. And every time we were going northwest, we're just looking out the window to see what we could see on the ground. What was firing, what was not firing. Where that scud had launched from, moments later, there was all kinds of bomb impacts and all kinds of sparkles, I think, from some of these cluster bombs going off around where that scud had launched. I do not know to this day if they got that scud launcher or not, but man, I just remember that thing launching, going through a cloud deck, and then going over our heads because we could see it up through the eyebrow windows of the tanker heading toward Riyadh. And Kevin called it in and said, hey, we see a scud. It's going over the top of us. Looks like it's heading toward Riyadh, which is exactly where it went. Desert Storm really prepared me for the rest of my career. I had flown combat missions to include one mission into Iraqi airspace. And I had a lot of flying confidence. I felt like I was bulletproof when I got back to Kadena Air Base. A couple of things I learned from Desert Storm. Preparing your mind for where your body's going to take you and being the exception. Darren Hardy, great motivational, inspirational, educational speaker. His crew always talks about being the exception. And sometimes that requires you going into a place that's gonna make you feel really uncomfortable, but you've gotta do it in order to be the exception. And the tankers were doing exceptional work. One of the things John Boy told me in our phone call years later when I was writing the book was, we knew that you guys would be on altitude, on time, ready to refuel. And a lot of times you knew we had to move before we knew we had to move to get to our target areas. And that's been one of the hallmarks of the KC-135. They've been prepared mind, body, and soul to do their mission and to be exceptional. During Iraqi freedom, same thing, an exceptional record. General Mosley told me, your team has performed magnificently. The tankers have been performing magnificently in this war, just like we had during Desert Storm. The other thing I learned about this is air refueling is about the customer. And I spent a lot of time learning what did our customers need? But more importantly, what did they do once they got the gas? I have been told on numerous occasions, oh, you just want to be one of those fighter guys. You're flying tankers and you want to be a fighter guy. You're still a fighter guy. And it wasn't because I wanted to be a fighter guy, although I did want to develop that attitude, because I wanted to know what our customers required. Knowing what they were going to do after they left the tanker helped me better prepare my crew and the air refueling fleet to satisfy our customer requirements. A lot of people thought it was really strange that I would call on training missions to our receivers to talk to them on the phone. And what I was doing was trying to find out what do you guys need? What's your timing? Where do you need to be dropped off at? What are you doing after you leave us? Are you coming back to us? Because again, that helped me prepare my mind for what we're about to do. And I was a better pilot because of that. I took a lot of ribbon because you just want to be a fighter guy. But no, it's because I had knowledge of how they were going to perform and what they were going to do afterward. And Kadena was the best place to learn that from the F-15 guys. I worked in planning and tactics there, and it was one of the greatest jobs I ever had. Flying combat missions, you're going to see things that you're going to remember the rest of your life. And all the times that I have flown missions, planned missions, executed missions, there are 20 to 30 that I can bring back into my mind in a nanosecond. I can bring back the images, how I was feeling, the emotions I was feeling, the emotions of my crew, the emotions of the people I was working with in a nanosecond. But the one thing that I remember most is the things that I saw. That's why I always carried a camera with me. For my 24 and a half years, 
in the tanker, I always had a camera and 10 rolls of film in my helmet bag that I could reach back and get to almost on every mission without fail. There are 32 pictures in my book, Tanker Pilot Lessons from the Cockpit. And a number of those pictures, all of the airplanes are carrying live weapons because they're in actual combat. And that helps me remember some of these things too. I'll never forget Stingray flight coming up. Gunship gray airplane, black markings, white rock eye bombs. I'll never forget watching ground fire coming up. Bombs going off on the ground. And that scud going over the top of us. Along with a lot of other images in my mind. Refueling John Boy. Kenny had his video camera the night we refueled John Boy. We did not have it plugged into the radio, so it doesn't have any audio, but you can see the weasels out on the wings and the flashing red beacons and the slime lights and the lights of the weasels shining down on the on the harm missiles, their anti-radiation missiles. All of us go through life and events, and there's times where those images during those emotional time period will never go away. And that was one of the things I really appreciate about my time in the tanker. I had this incredible window to the world and saw incredible things. People always ask me, what do you remember most? And that is these images. And second thing, the food. I enjoyed a lot of great food. <laughs> so here's what I want you to commit to. You have a cell phone. When you're in some of these events, take pictures of the really joyous times. But I want you, when you're in the hard times, write a journal. Write down your emotions. Write down the things that you're thinking. Go back and read those things when you're going through the hard times again. Because I guarantee those things that you're thinking and feeling during these really incredible emotional times will help you get through the other trials and wars and conflict in your life. I've been keeping journals now since 1977. I have, I think, about 20 to 21 volumes now. Since my son died in 2010, I've been filling a 200-page journal about every year. I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions, a lot of events, but I also take pictures of them in my phone so that I can go back in my journal and see the pictures and tie the emotions to it. And believe me, when you're going through those tough times, writing it down and getting out of your brain will be a great tool for you to help get through it. As Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. And one of the ways to do that, I think, is taking pictures and writing in your journal. Another thing I do in my journal is I write down thoughts, inspiration that comes to me. Sometimes I don't know it's inspiration, maybe call it revelation. But usually down the road, I find out, wow, that was a really inspiring time and I'm so glad I wrote it down in my journal. And I have written sometimes pages of inspiration and thoughts that have come to my head when I've been pondering about Wall Pilot, the company that I run that does custom aviation artwork, writing more books and events with my family and things that are going on around me. I have a place I like to go down not but 50 yards from the house. It's a bench under this big, huge tree. And I have this little notebook that I'll take with me. I write little bullets in that notebook and then I come back and write it all down in my journal. Take the time to sit down and write down all of those words that are coming into your brain. Because believe me, down the road, they won't seem so crazy when you see events unfolding in front of you and you're like going, oh, I had inspiration on this. Thanks for joining us today on Lessons from the Cockpit and reminiscing 31 years ago about missions I flew during Operation Desert Storm. Wall Pilot has four, six, and eight foot prints of John Boy's F4G Wild Weasel that I refueled that opening night of Desert Storm. Several of the 58th Fighter Squadron Gorillas F-15Cs 
are also available at wallpilot.com. I've put a link below to John Boy's airplane and one of the Gorilla's F-15s that we refueled there in Tangerine on that one night we watched the Scud go over our heads. Again, these are custom art prints for the walls of your home or office that peel off and you can stick onto your walls. They come in four to six and eight foot versions. Thanks once again to Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit, for supporting this episode of Lessons from the Cockpit. Tanker Pilot can be found on Amazon in all four formats, hardback, softback, audible, which also has an extra file with all the pictures, and on Kindle. On next week's show, we're gonna talk about one of the noble and great ones of aviation. His red underwear, one of the greatest victories that he was involved with in air warfare, and also one of the greatest defeats he was also involved with, and how he narrowly missed being incinerated. All next week on Lessons from the Cockpit. I'm your host, Marcus Sarah. Thanks for joining us today, and we hope you have a great week.